And in England, King George III was confined to his palace at Kew as his second attack of madness took hold. The case for hereditary monarchy had never sounded less convincing. It's really a piece of horrid injustice that George III is remembered for his madness when he's actually one of our most able and popular monarchs. He's dedicated. He's somebody who really cares about the public. And it's such an extraordinary shame that perhaps this combination of excessive diligence with uh, physical weakness pushes him faster and further into madness than might otherwise have been the case. Keep up, keep up. Where are you? George III, the farmer king, was a lover of nature and the countryside. He ruled for 30 years in barnstorming good health without any sign of the insanity that would come to dominate his life. Of Majesty! That sign came in the autumn of 1788, on the 22nd of October, when the king's physician, Dr. George Baker, was called to attendance. I was received by His Majesty in a very unusual manner, of which I had not the least expectation. The look of his eyes, the tone of his voice, every gesture and his whole deportment represented a person in the most furious passion of anger. God does these things for us. God in his mercy. God in his great goodness. George's first attack of madness was certainly very shocking um, um, and frightening to his contemporaries. It, it consisted of symptoms such as foaming at the mouth, rapid um, speech, um, violence, extreme bouts of passion, uh, his temples and the veins in his temples popping. And increasingly, obscene <laughs> behaviour before the ladies of the court which his drunken friends were only too quick to copy. So, have you are you listening, buddy? Are you listening? Are you listening? These people, they're not listening. They do not drink enough. This is the problem. Come this on, is the problem. But by the end of the year, it was reported that George had tried to plant a stake, believing meat to grow on bushes. How wonderful. Hey, listen, this is. So good to see you. Stay back. Stay back. Stay back. Have you no respect for his imperial majesty? So good to see you. And you've lost weight. When he attempted to shake hands with a tree after mistaking it for Frederick the Great, it was clear that George's problem was no laughing matter. George's insanity couldn't have come at a worse time. Only 13 years previously, America had declared its independence, and fighting in the colonies continued. Across the channel, the forward march of revolution was trampling the monarchy underfoot. War with France and a decade-long tussle with Napoleon were just around the corner. Britain was caught in an international storm, the like of which it wouldn't see again until World War I. More than anything else, the nation needed stability and leadership. What it got instead was scandal and upheaval. George III is doubly unlucky and he becomes mad at a time when British politics developed an absolutely superb mass information system. Uh, particularly cruelly, it's the great age of the caricature. And therefore, Parliament, the press, provincial newspapers, coffee houses and debating societies are all there online to take up the question of royal madness. Everyone in Britain, and Britain's enemies abroad, knew about George's madness. For the first time since Oliver Cromwell, the very existence of the monarchy was being openly debated. With an anxious nation looking on, the pressure on the men charged with treating the king was fearsome. But George's doctors had little first-hand experience of mental illness and often seemed to be groping in the dark. Initially he was seen to be suffering from ague, from fever, from hurries, and there, were, there was a whole panoply of terms ascribed to George, none of which seemed to fit. 
It was felt at first that the king was suffering from flying gout, a catch-all diagnosis for anything Georgian doctors couldn't account for. They believed it was a harmless affliction, unless it reached the head. George's doctors tried a variety of techniques to draw the gout from his body, including sweating, blistering, bleeding, and leeching. Leeches are a convenient way of taking blood. They have a sucker at each end, and they have a, a mouth which contains three jaws with some 60 odd teeth on each jaw, so that when they actually bite into you, they give you a Y-shaped wound, which of course is very difficult to heal. There are a number of places on the body where they could actually be placed, but the arm is about the most convenient. We place it onto the skin. He's now biting in and there's a small amount of pain, a bit like a pinprick. He is hungry. He is biting in. Neither leeching, nor bleeding, nor any other treatment offered any sort of relief, and George drifted deeper into madness. Eventually, and with great reluctance, the royal doctors agreed to step down in favor of a so-called expert, Dr. Francis Willis. By the 18th century, there was a growing interest in mental disorders, but the treatment of the insane was hardly pleasant. Willis's methods ranged from the use of ropes and restraints to his own secret weapon, the eye. Your hand made well by me, sir, by me. Dr. Francis Willis had this wonderful technique of I give them the eye, sir. Yes, Your Majesty. Now, this was probably part chicanery, part just imposition of his own rather forceful personality, and part what he would see as moral therapy. That is to say, he would give his patients a particular look, and they knew that behind that look might be some limitations on what they could do. Thus, if he looked at them and said, you will have your breakfast and behave nicely, then they knew that if they didn't, it would be strapped into the chair, or given an unpleasant emetic, or whatever it might be. Now the time has come for me to relieve all those problems you have suffered. It is easy to see Willis as a caricature of medical cruelty, but the regime he imposed on George may well have saved the king from an early death. I want his treatment was probably appropriate for what was going on. They had to somehow control him or he would run out of gas and people used to die from manic exhaustion in those days. So keeping him still, making sure he ate and drank and trying to get him to control that agitation via various behavioral techniques was probably a good idea. Doctors from all over the country denounced Willis's methods but in 1789, the king recovered, and Willis was rewarded with a fat pension and state honors. The rejoicing that accompanied the news was, however, premature. Poor Frederick, poor Frederick. <laughs> he could well do with us. The royal family lived in constant dread of his regular relapses, and the attacks were taking their toll on the king's mind. In 1810, soon after sombre celebrations to mark George's golden jubilee, came a final attack that marked an irrevocable descent into madness. His physician, Dr. Warren, was summoned to Parliament 
where he tactfully phrased his report in Latin. Rex Noster insanit. The king is insane. In 1810, with Napoleon sweeping all before him, an emergency debate in Parliament declared a regency, the first ever for an adult monarch, with George's son, the Prince of Wales, stepping up to the throne. The Prince of Wales was irresponsible, a drunkard and a spendthrift, but in times of national crisis, anyone is better than a madman. George was confined to Windsor, a royal prisoner for the remaining 10 years of his life. Despite medical bills that ran into millions, the cause of George's condition was never identified and has continued to be debated right up to today. Possibly the most convincing diagnosis was one in the 60s by Hunter McAlpine, um, which suggested that George was suffering from a metabolic disorder known as porphyria. Porphyria is a strong possibility, but it's rare and difficult to diagnose with any real certainty. The king's symptoms in his later years suggest another diagnosis. By now, he had become a tragic figure, blind and deaf, living in near isolation, exposing himself to servants and addressing friends long since dead. This behavior has fueled a belief amongst modern day psychiatrists that the king's condition was nothing more exotic than manic depression. Clearly the standard story that's come down is porphyria, a very unusual and rare disease. But if you look at his, at his symptoms, it's much more likely he had manic depressive disorder. This is a commoner illness, it reflects his symptoms, and it often ends in Alzheimer's disease, senile dementia. He would speak to courtiers and, get, and mistake them and not know who people were, and that's absolutely typical. With George's death on the 29th of January, 1820, one of the most intense periods of instability in the history of the British monarchy came to a close. Under the Regency, Napoleon had been defeated and the Industrial Revolution begun. But the implications of George's madness reached far beyond his own lifetime. The various madnesses of George III did create a shift in the Constitution. It took us from the age in which kings still lead armies in person, which is just what um, the previous king to George had done, to an age in which monarchs are more